I'm Carlisle Hashem and welcome to the Carlisle's Chesapeake Show. I have with us Leslie Cario here today. We're here in Easton, Maryland and um, Leslie you have a consulting business called Chesapeake Horticultural Services. Yes. Tell us what you do there. Well I work as an independent consultant to nonprofits, nurseries and landscape organizations, um, landscape operations and I uh, have a focus on native plants and conservation landscaping. So you've worked with uh, the Master Gardeners and tell us about some of the other organizations. Um, well, I, I do a lot of work with Atkins Arboretum. We have some projects with um, propagating plants and working with their living collections database and um, I also work with them to source plants for their native plant sale that's held every spring and fall. And we have some of those native plant sales here that we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, uh, let's talk about the fact that we are so close to the Chesapeake Bay and how we would like for people to walk away today knowing that they can do something to help the bay. So um, could you tell us about conservation planting? Sure. Well, if you're interested in landscaping or gardening in a way that's bay friendly or you know, doing conservation landscaping. You don't have to rip everything out and start from scratch. You can just start by integrating some practices that um, all add up in the long term. So, um, for example, working to conserve water on site or make sure that water leaving the site is clean, um, promoting healthy soils, providing wildlife habitat, and especially planting native plants. There are eight elements that you would like our listeners to uh, go to the website and talk, and if you could talk about those eight elements, please. Sure. Um, well, those I mentioned are four of the most um, important eight elements, and um, you can get the full information on the website of the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, and this is, this is the guide. You can download the eight elements for free or you can order a printed copy for just a few dollars and it outlines all, all of the elements there. And when, say I have bought a, um, a house and there's a garden there already, I don't know what's in the garden and perhaps it's best to wait and see what's going to come up first before I start <laughs> ripping up. <laughs> That's always a good idea. You, you will find all kinds of treasures probably and um, just get an idea of what's blooming as you go through the first season. So, um, so many of our native plants are providing benefit for pollinators and the best way that we can um, do this is to plant so that you have a variety of things blooming at different times throughout the year. And um, so, you know, if you already have a landscape in place and you want to supplement that with additional native species, then you look and see where you have windows of opportunity where, you know, maybe nothing is blooming and, and you want to add in. So we, uh, we think beauty, you know, we think flowers, we think beauty, but I think we're beginning to think more, well, beauty comes not just from the flowers, but it comes from what is attracted to the flowers and how that increases our s sensory <laughs> um, delight over the garden. Uh, so could you talk about what we might get back from planting a, a flower that might not be as pretty as you would be the first, that would be the first thing that you would uh, pick to be in your garden? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, with honeysuckles. They've been so widely planted and many of the species that we're used to seeing are, are not native, but there is a native honeysuckle, sometimes called coral honeysuckle, and it has a red bloom and it's something that um, will bloom quite profusely mm. from October through, or excuse me, April through June and then continue on at a slower pace through October. And it is just marvelous for attracting hummingbirds. There are butterflies that use this plant as well. And then when those flowers go to see the bright red berries that will be fed upon by birds. Later oh, in nice. The season. So you could have, say, a trellis for some elevation in your garden with the honeysuckle there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not going to be invasive to the rest of your garden? That's correct. That's great. 
Well, we have um, a couple plants here. If you could tell us about them, please. Sure, um, this is just a sampling of the plant material um, that you would find at the native plant sale at Atkins Arboretum. And, and they're not dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. At this time of year, the plants are dormant. And so essentially they're taking a rest and as temperatures start to warm up in the spring, they'll break dormancy. But um, one of the things that is uh, um, good for wildlife is to keep the vegetation from the previous year intact if it's planted in your landscape until you get into the later part of the spring. Um, so this, this is an ornamental grass and this is um, actually a flower, the soldaga, right? Right. And panistetum, um, no, not panistetum, panicula. This, this is a panicum brigatum, <laughs> the switchgrass. Yeah, and so both we, we leave the seed heads intact as long as possible so that animals can use this for cover and also for food. So um, the panicum brigatum, the switchgrass here, is one that is um, a food source in terms of these um, seed heads are eaten by birds and other wildlife. It's good for cover. As the plant grows, it gets wider and wider, and it's a good place for animals that need to nest and hide. And um, one of the things that's probably most remarkable about this plant is its root system. So particularly if you have an area where erosion mm -hmm. is an issue, the roots of the switchgrass can reach up to 10 feet. Wow. Below the plant. So it's gonna <laughs> soak up a lot of water then? It, it will help with, with um, yes, it will help with keeping water on site and using that water, but also just help hold the soils in place. Getting back to those elements. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Um, and then this is a Solidago Fireworks. It's a type of goldenrod that's mm -hmm. pretty popular. It has profuse yellow blooms um, as you go later in the summer and into the fall. And that's another one that's good for um, pollinators and it's good for other types of wildlife that will eat the seeds. And if I remember, remember correctly, you're supposed to buy three or five um, for grouping purposes, an odd number for grouping purposes? Well, a lot of times that is the case with landscape design principles, and if you have enough room to um, put in multiple plants, not just one of a species, um, but start with a couple that you'd like to try right. and group them together, then you're more likely to start attracting whatever type of um, butterfly or moth or other type of um, insect or right. creature that you'd like to see. There are more and there will be more food source for them. So these two plants would be good for me to perhaps buy one or two, put it in my garden just to see where I want it, then I can always transplant them and put them someplace else if I find that, oh yeah, I like that and I want a grouping of, of uh, the switchgrass or the soldago. That's correct. You can always try something out and see how it does. And in terms of people having questions about their gardens, you have a couple websites that you would recommend people calling? Um, yeah, I would point you towards, um, I think I'd say First of all, I point you towards the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council and the, the eight elements that we were talking about. If you're interested specifically in native plants, there is a wonderful guide available online also, um, one that is free, called the Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping of the Chesapeake Bay Region, and that's put out by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. So it's actually hard to get in print these days because it's been so popular, but you can just download it for free oh, great. on the internet and it tells you so much information about the plants that are native to this area that it helps you make selections. And tell us about your work. At, you have a couple projects going on at Atkins Arboretum. Well, one of the things that we're working on right now is getting ready for the, the spring new plant sale and um, sourcing plant material from all around the Mid-Atlantic region because we're having over 200 species of plants that are available to choose from. And they're available throughout the growing season and in early fall, second week of September, we have another sale at that time. Um, one of the other things that we're doing on site is called the Native Plant Propagation Initiative and we are working with a core group of volunteers to collect seed and cuttings of plants that are locally native 
and we're propagating those at the Arboretum. So you're doing the legwork for us novices to learn more and more about what which species are the most important ones for us to grow to attract the wildlife that we want to have in our gardens? That's correct. We're really focusing on some of the ones that we'd like to, you know, we think have great value and we'd like to get a little bit more into the horticultural trade. And by doing this type of work right at the Arboretum, it's a wonderful opportunity for not just um, the volunteers who are working with us to learn, but also for others as we amass more plant material, we'll be able to plant those into demonstration gardens and provide a, a learning opportunity in that way as well. Well, Leslie, it's been a pleasure having you here, and we hope to have you here again. Thank you. Thanks so much. We are MCTV, Midshore Community Television. We want your help in making our station more robust so that we can better serve the residents of Talbot County. So, how can you help? If you are already making video content, submit that content for broadcast to the station. It's free! Are you involved in events, shows, or lectures that would be of interest to the community? We can work with you to figure out the best way to capture those events for airing on MCTV. Be it training, equipment rental, or hiring our production staff to film at a reasonable rate. Do you want to produce your own show? Let us help you get started. Come be a part of this valuable community resource. Email the station at nick at avalonfoundation.org or visit us in the basement of the historic Avalon Theater at 40 East Dover Street in downtown East. Welcome back. We're here with Bill Boycourt, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences. Uh, they're they're uh, placed here in Horn Point, which is just outside of Cambridge. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Um, we are here today because two weeks ago there was a talk by Upstream Alliance here at the Avalon, and it was a fascinating conversation about the sea level rise and uh, Solomon Island, particularly with Solomon Island and with Tangier Island. And um, if you could tell us you were part of that forum. I was, and, and I was the token scientist. Uh, the rest of the people were all either environmentalists or the most compelling people were the people from the island, uh, both Smith and Tangier. Uh, the building was sea level rise, erosion, uh, the big issue is loss of land for the people, and um, it was really not the time to talk about uh, climate change that much. No. It was to talk about the next few decades, and the big issue there is how do we protect the island to get a few more years before we have to do something really um, heartrendingly difficult, that is move off the island or somehow build a, a, some kind of wall. Well, it was very poignant because the mayor of Tangier Island, Tangier being in Virginia, uh, and uh, and um, Smith being in Maryland, but Tangier has a governmental system, whereas <laughs> with 200, uh, just over 200 people on Smith, they don't, they have their pastor who was part of the forum who's, who's the mayor, but so the the mayor of Tangier Island said, we don't like asking for help. They're very independent people, but in essence, he was saying, we need help with a wall. The, uh, he, Uker Eskridge is the mayor's name, and he was famous for uh, the president, uh, Donald Trump, having called him and said, don't worry about sea level. I thanked him for his support, because the, the island went for about 90% for Trump. Um, but don't worry about this, because you've got 200 year, more years, which is probably not the case. But the hope is that through that political connection and, and that they would get this, what they call the wall, which they need on the northwest part of the island to protect the erosion. That's the big, where the big waves come from. It's the most exposed, long fetch toward the Potomac River. Here's, here's the first time. I'm gonna mention erosion. <laughs> and there is a relationship between erosion and sea level rise, but you guys got it right. I'm not voted anyway. 
And uh, <laughs> the uh, erosion is the problem right now. There's something we can see. I can see it. Uken can see it easier because he's surrounded by water. You can too. You put a stick in one storm can move that that shoreline back pretty fast. Um, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, the good news about erosion. If there is any good news, is we can we can do something about it. <clears throat> we can build a wall. Yep. And and I think that the, the, your pleas for a wall are, are incredibly well taken. And I wish everybody would rally around and help out this this process because it's really not that expensive. And I'm, I mean, it's more than I make in a year, but it, it's, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't really cost that much. And it will buy us time. Tangier and Smith Island are important more than just the to the the, 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 the uh, inhabitants, but they're big spiritual and cultural uh, resources for both states. And islands are disappearing, it's a fact. Islands are disappearing in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we're spending lots of money um, with an island, rebuilding an island um, for, off of Talbot County shoreline. Yes. Um, so this wall, could you just tell us a little bit about well, they, 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 to really protect them in one sense, you can build a wall all the way around like we have for these dredge material places like um, uh, Hart Island. Island Hart and Poplar Island. Um, but what they really need is a fairly short 300, 500 foot length of what looks like a breakwater. It is a breakwater. And they're not really that expensive, a few million dollars, but in, in the big picture, for that culture, uh, that's certainly worth it. And when you lose, if, if, if in fact the evolution of the bay is such that we will be losing more islands, if you can stop that erosion, if you can slow it down, it helps other habitats. It's not just, oh, well, you know, we can't worry about that island because we're here on, we're here in Crisfield or we're, we're here in Dorchester County. We, it's, you can't think that way, can you? Uh, that, well, that's correct. Uh, the, 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 we, the, we all know uh, salt marshes are extremely important to the ecology of the bay, of any coastal area. They're, they take nutrients up, they harbor lots of uh, species of uh, fish. Um, sea level rise is an issue uh, because it does accelerate the erosion that they see. They don't believe in sea level rise, but it doesn't really matter for them in a lot of ways. And their, their faith is very, very strong there. They're hoping that that somehow things will work out. We're unfortunately in the hot spot of sea level rise. Uh, that's sort of Way in on the Chesapeake Bay. Well, and from Chesapeake Bay in particular, but anywhere from uh, New York to Cape Hatteras. Uh, in particular, we have the land sinking from the previous uh, ice age. Uh, it, it squished it up, now it's settling down. 10,000 some years ago. <laughs> Correct. Um, and um, there's uh, uh, groundwater extraction where all the water on the eastern shore comes from the ground. That helps sink and compact the soil. And then there's this um, uh, third thing that, that we're not really sure about how big it is, but it, we know that the Gulf Stream seems to be slowing down a bit, at least at times. and that area of, of, of where the sea level is rising as a result of that is from, from New York to Cape Hatteras. They all conspire to make us, uh, the sea level go up twice the rate it is globally. So that uh, our projections at, at um, 2050 are to be about uh, over one and a half feet of where it is today. And that's a big rise. We have a range going from the minimum of 1.1 1, 1 .1 feet to a maximum of 2.4 and it's 2.1, excuse me. And it's going to be our best guess is 1.4 feet. And if if you can't see that because the the people on the panel were talking more about erosion on the islands, but if you can't see the sea level rise and most of us can't see that, you're studying it because you have the gauges sure, all around the sure. bay. But um, you could go down to Hampton Roads, and they, from what I've read, experience flooding just when there's a full moon. They're the third most vulnerable city in the country for sea level rise. Third Northern, most. Third most vulnerable. Vulnerable. Yeah. Wow. And the, the, the one 
is the first is uh, New Orleans. We've heard about that. Right. The second is Miami. Uh, wow. Right now, high tides will and storm tides will will penetrate the, the porous limestone and fill the uh, basements of uh, high-rise be- uh, hotels on Miami Beach. That's a big problem. Yeah. Norfolk is is part of our sinking territory, and it's low-lying, and the military is way out in front of this. They're, they're facing the loss of the, the biggest base on the east coast of the United States wow. if, if they don't protect it somehow. And so they're, they're thinking ahead and they're making plans for Norfolk. Bill, you are um, an expert in tides, and if you could just tell us, please, uh, because I do not know that much about tides, uh, how they do affect the amount of water that's coming in and out. Well, tides are the sort of regular thing. We've, we've had them around all the time. They just, uh, the, the, the concept of tide is what the, the islanders certainly see when the, when the water gets high. So that the, the, when the moon, uh, which has a lot of gravitational pull, gets overhead, it, 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 it creates what we call a bulge and the, the water gets up. It's a little more complicated than that. There's, there's movements of tides moving around like long waves on, the, on, our, on our ocean. But the uh, difficulty of seeing sea level rise is people see the water go up and the water go down for, for the regular motion of the sun and moon pulling on the water. But also when the wind blows, it blows the water into the bay or out of the bay, and that, that's larger in the Chesapeake Bay than the actual astronomical high-low tide, the regular tide. So these variations are very commonly experienced by the islanders, and they can't, and no one can see that gradual rise associated with sea level, and it's uh, difficult for them to do that. And at, at the um, Upstream Alliance Forum, you spoke about what happened during Sandy and Chrisfield. Could you just touch on that for a minute? Well, that, that, that was a, a, a sort of a, a, a story that, that uh, we were admitting that we made the projections and we said, well, you know, we're not always correct on, on these projections. And we have with uh, Dr. Ming Lee at, at Horn Point a, um, a, a system on computers called the Chesapeake Inundation Prediction System. And, and that's still running even though it's not funded anymore. And when Hurricane Sandy came, uh, the people uh, who maintained edu- environmental education facilities around the Bay called me and um, three or four other people, and I was giving them real-time updates of the forecast. I said, first of all, I said, do not worry. <laughs> uh, because uh, when the hurricanes move to the east of, of the uh, Chesapeake Bay, to the, uh, off the coast, the circulation of the, of the um, it, the wind around hurricanes blows the wind from the north to the south and blows the water out of the bay. Not to worry. That's what I told my friends. And sure enough, the, 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 the hurricane came up and blew the water out of the bay. But as the hurricane was moving into Jersey, one of my friends, Don Baugh, typed to me and said, email and said, uh, let me show you a picture from Captain Lonnie Moore who has since become a friend on Tangier, and he said, "This is uh, the tide's a foot over the main street, and it's, it's the highest in his life, and it's keep on going up." And I, I, I so I got the picture, and I, I typed back and said, "Start worrying." <laughs> and what had happened there, which was a surprise. First of all, we were correct in showing that the in predicting that the water was going down in Baltimore and down in the south end of the bay, not a problem, but unbeknownst to us is that large, unusually large Sandy was blowing this big northwest wind on, on around the western side down the Potomac, and it's more complicated than this, but just blowing water up in the central region, which flooded Tangier, Smith, and above all, Crisfield. And it turned out that the, the predictions were correct. We were not looking at, at for those uh, unusual situations. We'd never seen that before, and now we're a lot wiser. But if we were, if they were r- relying on warnings to get out of town soon, and there was 200 houses flooded in Crisfield, then we would have failed them for that reason. We we're not paying attention. Well, these are like microburst, you know. That well, in this case, it was a, 
macro macro words. <laughs> now Sandy was a, a thousand miles across, a huge, a, a thousand kilometers across, huge storm that that ran into that low pressure system that intensified it and made it so so very devastating. Hmm. But we're living in the land of pleasant living, and it is beautiful here. And so this the, this is to educate people, not to make them worried, right? Well, the, the, you know, the, in, again, the, 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 for the, the people on Crisfield, and now the representative of other places around the Bay who are losing their land because of erosion and sea level rise, but it, it's particularly uh, acute there. They've lived all their lives, and they were very eloquent about uh, how much they, they, it's a different culture. It is. And Tom Horton's book, he was part of that. Uh, and their movie. And, and, and Tom wrote, spent a year on Smith, wrote a wonderful book called An Island Out of Time about that culture. He's still very close. You can tell that from the, from the, the, the and, and I've got, to, uh, luckily, have, have, have a chance to, to, to get to know some and, of these people. And that's why um, the woman who makes Smith Island cakes is making those cakes. It's not to make people happy with the cakes. It's to let people know about Smith Island. That's Mary Ada Marshall. And she's yeah. a, obviously a wonderful person. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for sharing with us your knowledge about um, the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. We're glad that you tuned in and look forward to seeing you on the next Carlisle's Chesapeake.